very nice little single. It's a short one, and a very good hook indeed. Got right inside the line there. Notice how he saw it so early. Always picks them up early, and that's well the hallmark of a master. Playing as a team, helping each other along, is not something you can just turn on and off. It's got to come from in there, something in the heart, something which binds you to another chap. Lovely. Square drive. Wally Hammond would have been proud. To keep a sense of balance and a sense of humour under pressure is you've got to be able to get the problem in front, in front of you. But even though you're involved in the match, either in the innings or you're captaining a rather crisis stage, you've got to always just have it out in front of you so that you can stand back from it and have a little smile at it occasionally and realise that it's not really the most important thing in life. It's the only part of life. There's Colin Cardry who has just played two superb strokes. You can see what we mean. That's got him on his wrist. Six runs still needed, and Colin Cardry coming out to bat with his left wrist broken. And the point being that David Allen has got the bowling. Cardry resumes, 19 not out. What tactics he can be suggesting, I just don't know. Last ball now. It's a draw! It's a draw. England have saved the game. Six runs short of victory. And chaos here at all. The umpires having the, the stumps pinched from them. I've never seen this at all like this. The players being chased in. They'll be lucky if they get there without losing something, even if it's only a hat or a sweater. during a home World Cup. I'm delighted that we have a record, a record number in the nursery pavilion tonight and that the lecture is being streamed on the MCC website for those who were either unsuccessful in getting tickets or prefer to view it at home. The Cowdery Lecture is close to the hearts of so many here tonight, not least me, as I'm lucky enough to call the family very close friends. So I'm thrilled that Jeremy and three of Colin's grandchildren are here this evening. Before I introduce tonight's lecturer, I'd like to thank Mark Nicholas and our two distinguished panelists. In this very special summer of cricket, I'm glad we were able to schedule this lecture so close to the opening of the Cricket World Cup with two legends of the game as our panel experts. So thank you, Shane for joining us tonight. We look forward, as always, to your direct and honest observations, <laughs> and of course, to the bowler's perspective. To Kumar, our president-designate, also a huge welcome and thanks. Amongst the deluge of enthusiastic messages that followed the announcement of your appointment, many made reference to your analytical skills as a relatively new commentator on our wonderful game. Mark has masterminded these panel sessions magnificently ever since the lectures began, and I know he'll do so again tonight. Thank you, Mark, for giving so generously of your time. There are many ways I could introduce Mike Brearley. The most obvious and logical would be as a former England captain, the man who masterminded that extraordinary comeback in the 1981 series and who also led England to our first World Cup final in 1979 on this very ground. I could also introduce Mike as a highly accomplished writer and contributor to the national press. Then there's Brearley and MCC, where Mike has held virtually every major position, from being an elected committee member to chairman of the World Cricket Committee and, of course, our president in 2007. There's Brearley, the psychoanalyst, for Mike's reputation as a leader in his profession is widely recognized. But perhaps the best way of introducing Mike is as a friend, and particularly a friend of cricket. For our club to have had the benefit of one of the greatest ever captains and to have access to his thinking, his ideas, and his viewpoints, has been an extraordinary contribution, not just to MCC, 
but to the game as a whole. Of course, there have been books as well. We've had Brearley on captaincy, Brearley on form, and most recently, Brearley on cricket. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Brearley on stage. <laughs> Anthony, you're too kind. How to follow that? But I'd really like to thank you and MCC for giving me the honor of making this speech. Uh, especially in, as you say, a remarkable year for cricket as well as for other national dramas. <laughs> Let's hope that the World Cup cricketers and everyone involved in the game of cricket do better than many of our politicians in maintaining respect and in playing hard but fair. <clears throat> Vinu Mankad was one of India's finest cricketers. In 1952, he took 12 wickets in India's first ever victory over England at Madras, and later in the same year, here at Lord's, after taking five wickets in England's first innings, scored 184 in India's second innings. Until one Ian Botham broke the record, he took 100 wickets and scored 1,000 runs in test cricket in fewer matches than anyone else. But many today know him for only one thing, and that's regarded as disreputable. Twice during India's tour of Australia in 1947 to 8, he ran out Bill Brown when the latter backed up too soon. The first time was at Sydney when the Indians played an Australian 11. Mankad warned Brown, but when the non-striker again left his crease before the delivery, he dismissed him. And in the second test, again in Sydney, he got him out in the same way. Apparently Brown was well out of his crease when the bales were removed. This kind of dismissal has since been called mancudding. It's been widely regarded as unsportsmanlike. Don Bradman, Australia's captain in that test match, defended the bowler. He wrote, for the life of me, I can't understand why the press questioned the sportsmanship. The laws of cricket make it quite clear that the non-striker must keep within his ground until the ball has been delivered. By backing up too far or too early, the non-striker is obviously gaining an unfair advantage. And the batsman himself said, I deserved it. Much later in 2017, Sunil Gavaskar suggested that his fellow countrymen had been unfairly criminalized. If you want to call it anything, he said, just say the batsman was browned, not man credit. <laughs> but cricketers and public across the board have agreed on the whole, that mancadding is unsporting. At every level, reactions have been vitriolic and self-righteous. Whatever the laws said, we knew it was wrong, or we thought we knew. Over the past two few years, opinions have shifted. Five years ago, I was here watching England play Sri Lanka in the fourth One Day International of that series. Chasing a total of 300, England were 111 for five when Joss Butler joined Ravi Bapara. They added 133 in 16 overs. During 10 of those overs, they scored 22 twos, many of them from hits against slower bowlers down the ground to long off or long on. As this was going on, it became clear to me that the non-striker, who was likely to be running to the danger end for the second run, was, was starting early from the bowler's crease. I wouldn't want to call it cheating, but it was stealing a march. It looked as though this might make a difference to the result. Uh, in the end, Sri Lanka won by only seven runs. Kumar Sangakkara, who scored a wonderful century earlier in the day, tells me that the Sri Lankan captain complained to the umpires during that match about the lack of any proactive measures by them to stop this. 
The final match of the series, which was level at two all, took place a few days later at Edgbaston. Once again, Butler was batting late in England's innings. Again, the young off-spinner, Suchitra Sinanayaka, was bowling. Twice, Sinanayaka warned Butler, and an over later ran him out. England were dismissed for 219, and Sri Lanka won the match by six wickets. The bowler, a young player, who was doing what he was given license to do by his captain and senior players and by the laws, was booed by the crowd. We discussed this issue at the World Cricket Committee a month or so later. The members were always, almost, almost all ex-international players from most of the main cricket-playing countries and from cricketing generations as far back to dinosaurs who played against me, uh, or I played against them, to current players. And to my surprise, there was virtually universal sympathy with the fielding side in this whole scenario. Either the batsman was stealing a march, people felt, or he was being dozy. As a result of the much-increased use of cameras in decision-making, if, as a bowler, you deliver what's afterwards been discovered to have been a no-ball by an inch, the batsman, who may have been bowled neck and crop, will be recalled. No one will suggest that you should be given a warning, nor will you win sympathy from teammates or spectators if you're the batsman. Doziness is not generally... I mean, if you're the bowler, sorry. Doziness in sport is not generally rewarded by indulgent kindness. And sport, after all, is as much a matter of keeping your wits about you as of being exceptionally moral. Moreover, now that fitness has become a key feature in the game, especially in limited overs cricket, the inches gained by quick running or lost to quick fielding are often crucial. Several ex-players, especially bowlers, see the hoo-ha about mancudding as a clear illustration of the fact that it's always been a batsman's game. The benefit of the umpire's doubt goes to the batsman, and it's always batsmen who get knighthoods. <laughs> I, too, had changed my mind watching that Sri Lankan match. I was no longer inclined to describe the action of Senanayaka as unethical or as against the spirit of cricket. Five years later, Butler was again run out, not long ago, while backing up, this time in an, uh, an IPL match. And bowler was Ravi Ashwin, the Indian off-spinner. This dismissal, again, aroused somewhat shifting responses. There was no warning, and it seemed that before taking the bales off, Ashwin paused briefly with his hand near the stumps, waiting for Butler's bat to be dragged over the line. It's arguable, too, that the decision was actually wrong, since Butler's leaving the crease took place after he would reasonably have expected the ball to have been delivered. The on-field umpires might even have been wise to consult the third umpire before coming to a decision. Along with many others, I felt that this was indeed a bit too cunning, a bit shabby. But I'm also certain that it's up to the non-striker to wait until he sees the ball leave the bowler's hand. As for Butler, I'm reminded of Oscar Wilde, who said, to lose one parent <laughs> may be regarded as a misfor misfortune, to lose both looks like carelessness. Another outcome of the debate at this time was the questioning in some quarters of the whole notion of the spirit of cricket, as if this nebulous aspiration were responsible for the dispute. One writer described it as a will-of-the-wisp located in an imaginary cloud castle three or four miles above the Lord's Pavilion. And Mike Atherton referred to it in 2016 as a lot of meaningless guff. Others criticised the presence of the spirit of cricket as a preamble to the laws, claiming that it would be of value only if it were to be accommodated with precision within the laws. 
Well, again, I too used to question the advocacy of the spirit of cricket, feeling that it tended to sound like, or even sometimes be, patronising or pompous. The notion could be used to support a set of standards that were proclaimed most loudly as part of the Victorian ethos, but not, al not always lived out consistently on the, cricket, on the cricket field, let alone off it. One vice attributed to the English was, after all, hypocrisy. Perfidious Albion was how we were regarded in some parts of the world. Today, the remit and atmosphere of MCC have changed radically, and I would say, for the better. Now we have a role in cricket somewhat akin to that of the House of Lords in politics, both bodies lacking power but retaining residual influence. As such, MCC is still the custodian of the laws of cricket and it runs a respected World Cricket Committee. It can be part of the conscience of the game, as South African cricketer Sean Pollock recently said, without setting itself up on a pinnacle of moral rectitude. I agree with the spirit of cricket appearing as a preamble to the laws and argue that this is the right location for it. I like, too, the fact that it's couched in simple and direct language. I think we should beware of elevating cricket above other activities. The spirit of cricket applies, or should apply, to all sports and is indeed relevant to the whole of life. So, to answer the critics. First, the maxim, the spirit of cricket, is meant to be vague, offering pointers towards an attitude of mind that's to be expected and hoped for from administrators and spectators as well as from players. Atherton himself wrote of the late New Zealand cricketer, Martin Crowe, who sadly died from cancer in 2016, Martin viewed his illness as an opportunity, given that it allowed him to confront the demons and the man that he felt cricket had made him into. So, latterly, his instincts for the game and people in it were invariably sound. He was against rampant egos, selfishness, boorishness and bullying. The takeover at the ICC by the at the ICC by the big three countries made him livid. That's all Atherton speaking. Well, not meaningless scuff, but I would say an excellent expression and indeed expansion of what the spirit of cricket is getting at. It suggests that his remark about meaningless scuff is not his whole opinion on the matter. Certainly the spirit of cricket, um, the content of it and the phrase, doesn't and isn't intended to offer solutions to the controversy about mancadding or to adjudicate, say, on walking. There are arguments on each side. The words in the preamble don't settle these and similar issues. But this doesn't mean that they are useless or meaningless. Atherton's description of Crow's later opinions is far from empty and many of the world's greatest moral precepts have this quality. Think of the golden rule. The Hindu version is, make right conduct, dharma, your main focus. Treat others as you treat yourself. In Islam we find, none of you truly believes until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. And Christianity asks us to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, I'd say the spirit of cricket is of this kind, and rightly so. It advocates respect. Implicitly, it warns against what Atherton said Crow was warning against, rampant ego, selfishness, boorishness, and bullying, and such like things. It's a nudge and a reminder. It offers a moral framework, hinting at values that go beyond and need to underlie the laws. Second, the critics suggest that the spirit of cricket is inevitably used as propaganda for local customs or prejudices. I agree with commentator Ian Bishop that social conditioning is often the main factor 
in what some group or other feels is correct. As a boy, I remember the outrage provoked when a player in my father's London club side was run out while patting the pitch down. The ball had not technically become dead. One social group thought this was fair enough. The other regarded it as, regarded it as scandalously unsportsmanlike. As with mancudding, this was a clear case of different social norms. There have been similar instances on cricket's large stage. Tony Gregg ran out Alvin Kalicharan in a test in Trinidad when the batsman was walking off the field before the umpire had called time. I think Tony didn't realise um, that. I mean, he turned round and saw him out of his ground and threw the stumps down at the bowler's end. Rather similarly, Ian Bell was run out when, on the last ball before tea against India at Trent Bridge in 2011, he incorrectly believed the ball had gone for four and had begun to walk off when the stumps were broken. And again, I don't think the Indian team realised what had happened. They saw him out of his ground and they took the bales off and he was given out. Both Kalicharan and Bell were later recalled, though both had been correctly given out according to the letter of the law. Now, I don't think there's an absolute answer to these ethical questions. And although one might hope for the generosity, or possibly for the not wanting to be seen as mean-minded, shown by the fielding sides in those two cases, by England in Trinidad, by India at Trent Bridge, it's not something one should rely on. In each case, the reversal of the decision was possible, only as a result of the fact that immediately ensuing intervals allowed for negotiation, discussion, and second thoughts. The problem is not so much the existence of the spirit of cricket as it's being used to justify one's own often passionate views when what's being advocated is the outcome of local conditioning, as Bishop said. But it's not inevitable that it should be used in such a way. Doug Insoll, then chair of the TCCB Cricket Committee, used to say annually to county captains in the 1970s, you can drive a coach and horses through the laws of cricket. In other words, the laws don't cover everything. They can't cover everything. It's wrong to imagine there might be a formula or algorithm applicable to all situations. There will always be cases that arouse uncertainty, strange events, shrewd but dubious decisions or actions that the laws don't specifically address or take into account. And there sometimes will be honest and honourable differences of opinion and feeling about what's within that spirit and what's not. Disagreements are, are not always a matter of our lot occupying the moral high ground and their lot going beyond the pale. Let me give some other examples. In 1980, I put all ten fielders, including wicketkeeper David Bairstow, on the boundary in a one-day international in Sydney against the West Indies, obviously before there were restrictive circles around the pitch. Uh, when the latter, it was against West Indies when the latter needed three runs to win off the last ball, and we won by two runs. In the instant of making my decision, I'd remembered MJK Smith doing the same thing to win a Sunday League match here at Lords a year or two before. Besto, the wicketkeeper, had a refilled beer can thrown at him from the crowd, and I received metaphorical beer cans, <laughs> which was less painful. Twelve months before, in a test match on the same ground, I put seven men on the leg side for our off-spinners, Jeff Miller and John Embury. Some Australians, not the players, I think, were appalled, accusing me of negative and defensive tactics, despite the fact that we had three or four close catches and dismissed Australia for 111 in 40 overs. And I regarded their huffy anger as an expression of sour grapes related to historic controversies and resentments. <laughs> in, in 1981, at Melbourne, when New Zealand needed six to win off the last ball to tie the match, Greg Chappell instructed his younger brother, um, notoriously really, to roll the ball along the ground underarm. 
Rod Marsh was heard to call out, no, Greg, no, you can't do that. Now, to give a tiny bit of context, Greg was apparently unwell at the time, exhausted and stressed. He'd wanted to leave the field earlier that afternoon, but had been dissuaded by Marsh. Almost 40 years on, though, I still feel uneasy about what Chapel did. I'm not sure I can put my finger quite on why it still strikes me as different from my two field-placing actions. I think it relates to Chapel resorting to a ruse that ruled out what would have been a remarkable piece of skill by the batsman. At the same time, I'm aware that his decision was legal and that it was not unlike what any current rugby team would do when, leading narrowly in an international and having kept possession for the last few minutes of the game, they kick the ball into touch the moment the clock has run down. Now, I don't criticise this, and I've never heard any pundits criticise it. To do so might be redolent of the mentality of the Edwardian-era amateur soccer team, the Corinthian casuals, who, I'm told, deliberately missed penalties because they didn't want to score so easily as a result of what may have been a trivial offence. As an aside, mention of the Corinthian casuals reminds me of a story about this person this lecture is named after. In 1974, at the age of 42, Colin heroically, or crazily, accepted an invitation to go straight from the depths of an English winter to face Dennis Lilly and Jeff Thompson in their pomp at Perth. The version of the story I prefer, and actually Jeremy tells me it's fairly close to the truth, uh, in, in the spirit of the truth, I hope, is that on his way into bat, he went up to Tomo, who was waiting at the end of his run-up, shook his hand and said, Mr. Thompson, I presume, <laughs> my name is Cowdery, very pleased to meet you. Well, I, I hope it's true enough. Now, just to return to my discussion about the field placing, I'd still defend those two experiments, which some observers thought went against the spirit of cricket. Putting the wicketkeeper on the boundary didn't preclude the batsman hitting the ball for four or six. It just made it less likely, and less likely that this would happen from an edge or a leg by. With regard to the 7-2 leg side field, it takes skill to bowl off spinners with such a field, inviting the batsman to hit against the spin on the vacant offside. I do admit that the inevitability of that reaction gave some spice to my pleasure in the whole episode. <laughs> I think the reaction went back to an assumption that packing the leg side in this way was no different from earlier strategies used by England in Ashes series first as an essential element in body line, second when Len Hutton instructed Trevor Bailey to bowl wide of the leg stump to restrict Australia in their run chase at Headingley in 1953, an occasion when England also resorted to blatant time wasting. I feel conflicted about Douglas Jardine and body line. Like Greg Chappell, as a matter of fact, I have a sneaking regard for what he did and the courage in doing it and carrying it through. But I still, in the end, feel that it went too far, that in an era when there was little provision for limiting persistently dangerous bowling, his tactic was too ruthless. Moreover, body line was employed before there was a limitation on fielders behind square on the leg side. Now only two are allowed, uh, body line itself being the reason for the change in the law all of which meant that such bowling, especially with Jardine's field placings and with the then-current attitude to wides, made proper cricket strokes more or less impossible. So was body line against the spirit of cricket? I think so. I feel so. Now, my examples so far require some knowledge of cricketing technicalities. Here's a piece of on-field behaviour that is both admirable, admirable and unrelated to the specifics of cricket and its practices. During an ODI in St. Lucia earlier this year, words passed between Shannon Gabriel, the West Indies fast bowler, and Joe Root. 
It transpired that Gabriel said to Root, why are you smiling? Do you like boys? Now this was, this was not heard publicly, but Root's reply was picked up by stump microphones. He said, don't use that as an insult. There's nothing wrong with being gay. Now, Joe, Joe Root's grin can be annoying. Opponents may experience him as laughing at their misfortune. And you may remember that late in the evening after England won the test match in, at Edgbaston in 2015, David Warner allegedly threw a punch at Root, who he felt was mocking the Australians either by smiling provocatively or by wearing an Australian hat as a wig. <laughs> as Hamlet says of Claudius, one can smile and smile and be a villain. Not, of course, that I'm saying Root is a villain, or was, or that any of that would justify retaliation. As a matter of fact, my own impression that his grin is more his way of reassuring himself when he's just survived an error or had some good luck. In St. Lucia, though, his response was immediate and spontaneous. He was civil, calm, matter of fact, there was no emphatic self-righteousness. He'd had no opportunity to plan. There's a French expression for thinking of a perfect riposte too late. L'esprit d'escalier, literally the spirit of the staircase. That is, we often think of what we might or ought to have responded, but didn't, just as, though, just as we're going down the stairs, having missed our chance. Root spoke at once and not so much in the spirit of retaliation, more as a reflection on what Shannon Gabriel had said. Aristotle argued that morality is largely a matter of having established good habits of behavior, so that doing the right thing happens as a result of our second nature, if not of our first. And this is what was so impressive about his coolness. I like the fact that the French word esprit, spirit, appears in the phrase. The reaction was not the spirit of the staircase. This presence of mind reminds me of an impressive intervention by another international test captain. 2017 was the 70th anniversary of Indian independence, a celebration hosted by the Indian High Commissioner of cricketing links between India and England over those decades was held in the long run. 150 or so guests, mainly of Indian origin, were present, along with a few cricketers from different generations, plus those minor divinities in their smart, dark blue blazers, trim haircuts and beards, fit-looking and on the whole dashing, the Indian cricket team. And their senior god was their captain, the handsome, severe and charming Virat Kohli. Well, the event started with drinks and chat. When the players arrived, the social world clustered around them, avid for selfies. After a while, order was called and the commissioner welcomed the guests with a few appropriate remarks about the importance of cricketing links between our two countries. Both teams had, written, had reached the semi-finals of the Champions Trophy and devout hopes were expressed that they would meet in the final a few days later. But this being cricket was not to be the case. Pakistan defeated England in the semi-final and India in the final. An interviewer went from one cricketing celebrity to another with a microphone for short conversations about our experiences of playing against each other. The audience became restive. The buzz of their conversations grew louder, distracting from the interviews. Suddenly, Kohli stepped forward asking for the microphone. He was stern, to the point. You should keep quiet and listen to what people have to say, he said. It's impolite to talk among yourselves. People were shamed into silence, but only temporarily. The last interviewee was Coley himself. For a second time, he spoke forthrightly about the rudeness of the guests. Before acquitting himself admirably, with modesty and frankness, in the more ordinary aspect of his role as India's captain and spokesman. I was impressed. 
It's one thing to respond to questions when given the floor and the microphone. One's right and duty to speak has been formally announced. It's quite another to have the chutzpah to interrupt the flow of the program, not to mention the flow of increasingly irritating conversations, without invitation. Coley showed a natural authority and initiative. He was clearly at ease with the mantle of leadership. He was a man with an independent mind. Several aspects of his personal charisma, including articulacy and passion, were plainly observable. On the field, too, his presence is palpable. He's keen, lean, dynamic, totally involved. Watch Coley, and you sense from his reactions a great deal about the way the game is going. He wears his emotions on his sleeve. As was the case with Viv Richards, it's hard not to look at him when he's in the field. Along with passionate desire and high standards, he expresses both the communal team pleasure of joint success and the desolation of disappointment. If he believes the opposition have behaved badly, he will there and then, or at a press conference later, speak his mind bluntly, as he did at the High Commissioner's party. As a leader, Coley's aggressive, sometimes brash. He lives by and accepts, ex expects from his team a strong work ethic. He demands attention to detail. He's an excellent example of fitness himself, notably in turning every single into a two, if at all possible, especially when chasing a target. Less athletic partners may be run off their feet. I suspect he has little patience with laziness. Tactically, he's shrewd and inventive, looking for opportunities to attack. As a batsman, his run hunger is apparent. He's hawk-eyed, quick-witted, quick-footed, all energy. His conversion rate in turning 50s into 100s, 53.8% not long ago, was second to Bradman's, 69%. Roots recently was 25%. He has stamina, drive, and persistence. He's clearly the best batsman in the world, averaging over 50 in all three formats. The editor of Wisden India, Suresh Menon, noting his extraordinary ability to make use of the classical alongside the innovative, even in the shortest form of the game, wrote, his understanding of space and time is unrivaled. He's an Einstein among batsmen. Now, Root's remark in Trinidad and Coley's behavior at Lord's both exemplify the fact that there are no rules for this kind of courage. Cricket, a series of contests between two protagonists in the context of the team, reveals character, whether we like it or not. Situations crop up out of the blue without previous scripting. And that's one element in the appeal of cricket, perhaps even more than the sport in general, because of the vast differences of roles and the time that a ga cricket game reveals itself over. Playing cricket well calls for many personal qualities, for patience and restraint, as well as for emotion and spontaneity. No two situations are precisely alike. Courage is both habitual and creative. And the tempo of the traditional game encourages us to reflect on our misdemeanors and inadequacies. I want to end by saying that the spirit of cricket applies not only to the players, but also to spectators, to administrators, umpires, groundsmen, even to the media. Those making judgments about cricketers or sportsmen have some duty to act and speak in accordance with this sort of spirit. Judging calls for fairness, for justice tempered with mercy, for justice arrived at with accuracy of differentiation. For instance, in my view, it's not in the spirit of cricket to propose life bans for all those involved, however slightly, with corruption. That would be like hanging boys for stealing sheep. It was not present when Seninayaka was roundly booed at Edgbaston, or when an MCC member turned his back on women members because he's always believed the club should be for men only. Further, the spirit of cricket is not peculiar to cricket. It applies to all areas of life, even, dare I say it, 
to politics. It may be that those in favour of draconian punishments are in that very attitude, putting cricket on a pedestal of perfection that's unrealistic and ultimately inhuman. They have the idea that cricket should be totally pure, clean, where everyone else, everyone is to behave better than anywhere else. Purity is often a problem, leading to fundamentalisms of all kind. If we put our ethical standards too high, we risk hypocrisy and cynicism. If we put them too low, we tolerate a descent into contempt and even incitement to mutual hostility. One feature of the longer game of cricket is that players get a second chance. This principle needs to be applied to life in general. Cricket is played by human beings. We all have our foibles and weaknesses. We're all mixed. We're all human. So, let's enjoy the prospect of the wonderful cricketing program ahead, starting with England versus South Africa the day after tomorrow. All played and watched in a thoroughly good spirit in all areas of the game. Thank you. very excited about what lies ahead. The mood in the camp is very high at the moment and I think the prospect of playing a home World Cup is, you know, mouth-watering. Everything about this ground makes me feel comfortable and excited at the same time. So I'm both of those things and really looking forward to it. I'm excited for the Cricket World Cup and excited for everyone to get behind us to be honest. And it's I mean, any occasion you step onto the field with England, no matter what the game, no matter what the occasion is, 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 a, is a huge honour. In terms of one day cricket, you know, World Cup 50 overs is still the tournament everyone wants to win. Exactly what England needed. Look, it's, it's a pretty special day. Um, just to win the World Cup final out here is, is absolutely amazing. It's probably going to be the best World Cup for a long period of time. 2019, I mean, it's huge. We've got the World Cup and then we've got an Ashes series. So it's a huge year um, for cricket and it's a great year to keep people enjoying the game of cricket. Anytime you get the opportunity to play a test match at Lords is a huge honour. Um, it, it, it's a wonderful experience to walk through that long room and, and out onto such a historic ground. And we've got two really important test matches there this summer to, to make sure we get some wins. He surely was pleased with that, but he, he didn't. He just went over to the guy who's fought and nearly won the match for Australia. I think the, the, the spirit of cricket really embodies you know, human values, um, how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive each other. And irrespective of, of how tough the competition gets, uh, that you actually look uh, you know, to the core foundation of your, of, your, of your character. We all love this great game. It has a tremendous history and tradition. We want to keep that going. We want cricket to be played in the right spirit and played the right way, hard but fair. Playing the game in the right spirit is what we want to see, so it means a lot to all of us. Oh, yes. We've got a lot of great people in the world of cricket, and uh, it, the thing about cricket is it gives you the opportunity to meet so many different varieties of people. I think cricket's unique in the, whack, in the fact that it has the spirit of the game and laws and I think both need to be upheld in the best possible interest of the game. It's an elite club to seam stealing since an 1800. Absolutely magnificent. The England are on fire. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and particularly Mike Brearley, um, it was good, I think, that your, your sense of humour uh, came through, 
because I was taken back to 1981 at Basingstoke when Jeff Thompson bowled down the hill um, and frankly ran from close to the sight screen, so small is the ground, and he hit me in the unmentionables with a full toss. <laughs> and I hit the deck in a heap of pain and anguish. And there was a moment when the Middlesex players collected around me, and then a much bigger moment for a young player beginning out in the game when the Middlesex captain came to inquire how I was, and he looked down as I screamed my agony and said, it's quite apparent that your mother was an actress. <laughs> so actually, Brearley's a hard bastard, truth be told. <laughs> he wrote, in the space of no time, two books about the ashes and one about captaincy, the art of captaincy, that remain the go-tos for me in, in cricket entertainment and cricket information, both the mind game and the game itself. He was a damn good player, often forgotten that he was first chosen for England in 1976 against the West Indies as a batsman before going on to be thought of as the best captain who had been picked to play for England and ignored, rather, for his batting. He made some cock-ups along the way, and I'll refer to those in just a moment. <laughs> but he's become a very special person in English cricket, as the president explained earlier, for more ways than one. Tonight, he showed us many of those. Thank you to Mike Brearley. We have three guests on the stage, one of them you just heard from. The other two are equally special. The first is the president-designate of this great club. He arrived on the cricketing scene after Sri Lanka had won the World Cup in 1996, but was doubtless um, impressed, thrilled, and inspired by what he saw Arjuna Ranatunga, Aravinda De Silva, and all the others achieve in Lahore against Australia in 1996. He became a beautiful batsman and an outrageously successful batsman. In the last World Cup in Australia, he made four hundreds in consecutive innings in a World Cup tournament. That's quite an effort. In the 2007 final in Barbados, which Sri Lanka just lost to Australia, he made 50-odd. He's kept wicket. He's spoken here at the Spirit of Cricket lecture and enthralled us, not just with his brilliant use of words, but his brilliant forward thinking about the game. And he is, of course, Kumar Sangakkara. The next chap is, is, uh, is, uh, is a larrikin. Um, he may be the greatest bowler that ever played the game. If not, he's amongst the greatest two or three bowlers that ever played the game. He was chosen as one of Wisden's five cricketers of the previous century. Uh, it's true, really, that bowlers don't get knighted breers, but actually Sir Richard Hadley probably breaks that, that mold. There'd be others, but possibly Leary Constantine, the all-rounder, you know. It's a tight one. Gary Sober's not bad. Um, but I hear your point. Um, he did, of course, he did, of course, change cricket. Not just through the brilliance of his art, but through the flair of his personality and the strength of his character. Few men in cricket's history can have won more games on their own from nowhere. And he did it twice in key World Cup matches. In the 96 semi-final in Chandigarh against West Indies, and then against South Africa, of course, in 99 at Edgbaston, and went on to be man of the match in the final as well. He is perhaps the most exciting cricketer of our generation. Shane Warne. Can you pour me some water? And finally, um, our speaker or our lecturer tonight, um, who's done us proud, but I have to point out that his fifth bowler uh, in the 79 World Cup final was Jeffrey Boycott. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Brearley. <laughs> it's nice to be economical with the truth. Can you use some water? You want some? 
Um, yeah. um, Kumar, let's start with you um, and with Sri Lanka. Um, we're all saddened and shocked, or were shocked and are still saddened, um, by what took place in your country just a short while ago now. Um, where are we with that? How's the spirit of your great land? And how do you perceive the future of cricket tours to Sri Lanka? Um, just before we start on that, just you spoke about the semi-finals in the World Cup in '96, and you mentioned Warney and his bowling. Forgot to mention the Sri Lankan connection there, because umpire B.C. Kure was at, short, at, at, at the square leg umpire. When Warney bowled the ball, the slog swept, hit B.C. Kure straight in the head, and he stopped the boundary, and I think he won the game by about two or three <laughs> runs. <laughs> So, uh, Thank you. Um, so, yes, uh, 96. So presumably, B.C. Kure was setting up the fact that Sri Lanka could beat Australia in the uh, final. Absolutely. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you for, for your concern and wishes when it came to the tragedy in Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday. It, it really shocked everyone, uh, I think, not just in, in the country, but around the world as well. We've had 10 years of, of, of peace after, after war. Um, and now it's, it's been uh, an opportunity for us to really take a good hard look at ourselves, at uh, our society, at, at how we live our lives with people uh, who, are, who have different beliefs, who have uh, different inclinations uh, and differences of opinion with each other. Um, and time to really reaffirm in a, in a national identity, a Sri Lankan identity. Um, and the security situation, by all reports, the security forces have done a great job. Security is back to normal. Children are back at school. My children have been at school for a few weeks now. Um, there's still a bit of trepidation, a bit of fear. Um, and for me, I strongly believe that, that any cricket tour to Sri Lanka from here onwards will be absolutely safe. And I know it's significant next year in March when Sri Lanka tour, sorry, when England tours Sri Lanka. And I have absolutely no doubt in the ability of our security forces and our government to provide the security that is necessary. I've seen it firsthand during 30 years of war. And we will see that, that safety and assurance again, for sure. Mm. You went back um, with Murley after the tsunami and did a lot of uh, helping of families that have been torn apart by the tsunami. So you've seen that island suffer. You've played cricket against it a lot. You know it well. Um, favorite spot of yours in many ways I think for reasons outside of just bat and ball yeah it's a um, it's a wonderful place Sri Lanka I think in international cricket you need the cosmopolitan of all the countries to be able to play the different surfaces the different cultures that you yeah, get to the chance to experience as being a cricketer um, in 2005 when the tsunami unfortunately hit all over the world but uh, in Sri Lanka as well as a special place in my heart uh, when I had my year off um, my sabbatical um, <laughs> It was my first test match back in Sri Lanka and it was um, an amazing tour. So I, as a special place in 2005 when the tsunami that hit, I felt the need to go back and um, I got a few friends together. We put some cricket equipment, we put some colouring pencils, we got some toys and all that and uh, a couple of courier companies got on board as well. We put that all down to um, a guy called Kashil down in uh, Gaul and um, went down and helped the kids down there and it was just amazing. The people of Sri Lanka love their cricket, they're wonderful people and it's, as I said, it's a real tragedy what happened in Sri Lanka and I'm sure the tours that in the future will be absolutely fine in Sri Lanka and they should be because it's a great place to play. It's an interesting, it's a difficult, when we say sure, it's a difficult thing to be sure about, isn't it? But it's a confidence you have in your land to cope with the amount of trauma that could come with staging at all. Absolutely. I mean, I'm I've lived through it firsthand. There is never a hundred percent assurance of security or safety anywhere in the world. You do the best that you can. It has to be open communication. Everyone, the home boards, the touring boards, the touring parties, all have to be a hundred percent confident that it is safe. And that is how the, the world has been. In Pakistan in 2009, we were on the bus that was attacked and it was, you know, on the, on the way to the cricket ground, business as usual for us when the shooting occurred. Um, and we were back playing cricket within a month. Unfortunately, cricket has not gone back to Pakistan since then in, in, in terms of big international teams touring, which is unfortunate. Um, but whether it's a cricket tour, whether it's tourism, whether any of you want to come and visit Sri Lanka, I believe that it is safe. I mean, I live there. Um, I'm never gonna say it will be 100% safe anywhere else or even in Sri Lanka, but we're doing 
our very, very best to make sure that it is. Mm. Great. Um, let's move it on. Uh, uh, we're going to go to the World Cup first. I think it seems a sensible place to start and your chance to have a bounce back at me. Yes. Uh, 1979, um, England in a final against the greatest team in the world at the time. And um, it, it, it was such a different game. I mean, run rates were different, attitudes were different, skills were different. To come back to your, your little snipe... <laughs> It was a bit like pea shooters against artillery, you know, boycott against <laughs> Richards and Collis King. Um, but uh, I also want to mention that we wouldn't have got to the final if we hadn't had seven batsmen in the match before. Randall scored 42 at number seven, and boycott by probably six overs for 15 runs. You can believe it. <laughs> and, um, well, I can because he tells me most days. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then. And then, typically, boycott, because he's splendidly inconsistent. He then says, and then the bugger picked me the ball in final. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, well, it was, a, I think, yes, he, he may have a point. You made an interesting point to me the other day, though, about the batting and the fact that you didn't get stuck into Viv, who was presumably West Indies' no, no, no. fifth bowler. I thought that's what you were going to mention, actually, because I thought that was... Bob Willis wasn't fit as well, so we were short of a bowler. Um, and we had them 99 for three or four? Three. And um, Viv was given not out LBW, but we let that pass. Uh, and, um, let it go, Mike. Let it go. <laughs> let it go. That's a while ago, mate. Let it go. That's like, that's, <laughs> our, that's like asking Pringle and Gooch to let go of Javid Meander at LBW. No, they just can't do it. It's only 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no, well, um, what were we... You were going to say that oh, batting, maybe Viv, no, 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 Viv went for four and over. And I that. mean, yes, Viv went for four and over. That, well, that was the worst mistake we made. I mean, you know, that you had uh, Holding, Roberts, Croft and Garner, who are not bad bowlers, especially when they were bowling Yorkers with... Uh, we were wanting eight and, eight and over or ten and over with um, nine men on the boundary, you yeah. know? So it was not... not we didn't do our best for... Uh, of, of, I'm afraid. Mention of Viv, um, and I don't want to put the mockers on Joss, but of, of the players that I've seen, and you worked with Joss in the IPL the, the year before last, um, of the players I've seen, I can only think of Viv Richards and A.B. de Villiers as having the ability to attack defensive one-day bowling um, at every angle, off either foot, at every width, and able to hit you know, sixes down the ground off full balls, and etc. Et et I mean, have, have you seen anybody as widely gifted as Joss? Uh... I, th I think his talent he's got, and I think it's the selection of shots is why he's gone to the next level. I think he's always had the shots, and a lot of players have the shots. One, you've got to be able to execute them. But I think his timing of when he does it uh, is really something that's made him come to the next level. Like everyone, the balance between traditional cricket shots and improvisation is the key. Um, I think too many people try the improvisation too early in their innings. I think you get in trouble if you try it too early. Once you get in and you're established, and that's when you can start to dictate fields, you can manipulate fields with the bowlers. That's the key. And what Joss does, the amount of pressure he puts on a bowler um, because of the way he plays. Um, you know, there was a couple of times in the IPL match, you see some of these young, fast bowlers bowl, and they bowl a length ball and it disappears over deep mid-wicket. Then they say, well, let's pitch it up. And then he walks across and hits it over fine leg for six. Then they go the slower ball, and that disappears back over your head. You sort of say, you've got three balls to go. <laughs> you know, where, where are you actually going to bowl these balls? So I, I think he's just, he's, uh, he's smart. I think he, I'm really looking forward to watching him play in the World Cup. I think he's as good as anyone. Probably the most dangerous batsman in the world at the moment. Um, and, you know, the opposition really want to get him out early, you know, to try and attack him early. I think that probably Andre Russell at the moment is probably the most powerful player I can see, but... Joss would probably be the most complete package, I would say. I yeah. see West Indies got 421 today and they're friendly against New Zealand. I, I tell you what, if Andre Russell gets going, he, he's unbelievable. He's, he hits it hard. bigger than Gale, doesn't he? He hits some unbelievable yeah. balls, yeah. yeah. Um, which brings me to the, a, a, an interesting sort of general discussion, the balance between bat and ball. Are we concerned, Kumar, that as we go forward and 2020 and the 100, which I'll come to in a minute, take over, that, uh, you know... What a life it is for a bowler, huh? <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, it has been the case for a while, isn't it? It's also about trying to prepare the best pitchers that offer a bit of balance, whether it's through turn or whether it's through seam and swing. Either way, 
for some advantage to go to the bowler. You've had two new balls being used, reverse swing or natural reverse swing seems to have gone away from the game and that was crucial at the back end of innings for bowlers like a Lassit Malinga or even a Brett Lee to try and stay away from the middle of the bat. Standardization of cricket balls uh, has been discussed in, 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 in test cricket, but the real key is trying to get the entertainment factor and the fairness right. And it's going to be, it's going to be a struggle, but I believe if the, if the pitchers are good and the bowlers are still committed to trying to get their variations right and trying to be a little bit more creative and imaginative, it's a tough job for sure. But a lot of that pressure has brought about a knuckleball, back of the hand, slower balls, different actions, it's the same bowler bowling with different actions in one over, various kinds of innovations that have actually helped bowlers to cope, but hopefully they'll get some help as we go along. Go on, come on. I was just going to say something about innovation. I mean, I think one of the fascinating things about T20 cricket, 2020 cricket, is innovation. The things that Kumar's just mentioned, the whole list of things, bowlers as well as batsmen. And I like to see it. I mean, I, I think it's... Um, it's really interesting how you do bowl to someone who hits, does exactly what you said, Shane. You know, hits the first three balls out of the ground from totally different balls and totally different types of strokes. So I, I really, um, I, I, and that of course applies in 50 over matches in a more interesting, I would say even more interesting way because, you know, you can't just do that as a batsman. You have to, it's quite a long time actually, 50 overs, isn't it? So you, it's, I look forward to it. I, I, think, I, I think the bowl has got to get better. I think when you get the right conditions, that, that, that's the number one thing. You yes. must get the pitch right. If you get the pitch right, there's an even contest between yes. bat and ball. If you have an even contest between bat and ball, the bowlers are in the game. If you've just got a, a nothing pitch, the ball doesn't spin, doesn't seam, it doesn't do anything, then that's very, very difficult for the bowlers. But then they have to adapt to that. They, have to get be- they can still get better. So I, I, I just think I'm looking for this innovation in the World Cup from the bowlers more than the batsmen. We know what the batsmen can do. We know how they can... You, miss, you just miss your Yorker, you get it for six. Who could, The captaincy will win you the World Cup. The best captain in this World Cup will win it because they'll have better tactics and the bowlers will be able to execute their plans better. Because at the moment, as I said, if you just miss something, you go for six. So who's not just going to miss it or who's going to come up with bowling wide, slower balls that you can't hit? Or who's going to come up with something, six... Balls through here short on the bigger side. Like, I think tactics and the captaincy is going to be crucial to winning the World Cup. I mean, you have examples from the IPL. Andre Russell was having such a great tournament, it's almost impossible to bowl to him. And then you had all this analysis being done on where best York to bowl to stump, him. Yeah. Yorkers had leg stump, get it away from his head and, 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 and get him falling over. Rabada won a yeah. game bo- getting Russell bowled. Then Lassit Malinga went around the wicket to yeah. Russell and bowled short. Yeah. There are reports of, of, uh, of Bumrah, who first started bowling length to Mahendra Singh Dhoni because when Mahendra Singh Dhoni a few years ago had the hands been to, to, to get under any Yorker, they said, well, let's go length. Mm. And now he's come back and said, well, he's slightly older. Actually, I can, I can still get a Yorker through now, but let's confuse him with a few bounces. And mm. then, so there are lots of various ways to use mm. analysis and come up with different plans, like Warney said, but you must be committed and be able to practice it and execute it. And that's the ball is getting better. Can I ask you about 96 and 99? I mean, in Chandigarh, West Indies had, had you really, and, and, and you started their collapse, and then, uh, um, you know, the remarkable stuff at, 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 um, at Edgbaston in, in uh, 1999. I mean, what a cricket match that was. Proof, of course, that it doesn't... The, best, the perception of the best one-day game ever is the 4-3-4 game in Johannesburg. I would argue it's the 213 game at Edgbaston in the semi-final, in 1999, 213, played 213. Amazing, in 49.2 and 49.4 overs, the two innings, how about that? What is it about you? What is it about you that suddenly turns a cricket match? Sheer willpower, belief, how true is it that you stood in the dressing room in, at, at Adelaide in 2007 and said, no way is this game a draw, we're gonna win it, and here's how? Um, I, I, I've always tried to live by the same, never give up, no matter what the situation. Um, and you can only give it your best. In Adelaide 2007, you're talking about, um, I think going to the last day, it was 550, played 500, England were 50-odd ahead, and I was listening to everyone talk, and I was saying, well, what do you think England are going to do? And there's a bit of chatter around, and I just said, well, I believe we can win this because England will actually just come out and try and get themselves into a safe position. 
So even if we're not taking wickets, they won't get themselves in a position to take it away from us. If they came out really quickly in the morning and smashed 70 or 80 quickly, even if they lost a few wickets, it sort of got too far ahead. But if they just sat there and blocked it and tried to wear us down, not lose wickets, they weren't getting any runs. So there was always time left in the game. So that, that, I just thought we were a chance. The conditions where it was spinning a bit as well, there's a bit of reverse swing. I thought we were a chance. It was going to happen. Uh, the 99 World Cup um, it was a little different because sitting in that change, the, the question in those sort of situations, and this will also happen during the World Cup, is if the players ask themselves, what does my team need me to do now? What does my team need me to do now? And if you ask yourself that question, because I think there's too many sometimes players that want to make sure they take the wickets or make the runs. But someone that's batting at number eight or nine might just get a runner ball at the end or be able to hang in there with someone that's smashing it. So what does my team need me to do right now? If it's to take a wicket, then you've got to throw caution to win. If you get smacked, you get smacked. But you might just take a wicket. If it needs you not to get out, then don't get out. You've just got to find a way. And I think I've always sort of thought pretty aggressively about the game. And I've always thought that there's a chance, no matter what. Because I don't believe you're as good as your last game. I always believe you're as good as your next game. And you can, you're as good as your next ball. The next ball could be the one that changes the game. So I always sort of had that ability to um, think that it, the next one's yeah. going to be it. Yeah. Well, you, than... you led perhaps as good an example as Warney of that in Ian Botham. Yeah, he was, he was a great optimist. He, he would try anything. He was, he was, I, I would think about Warney is that what he had was he was a great attacking bowler. He was a great defensive bowler as well. I mean, he could stop the runs. He could get back control to the fielding side. He could bowl around the wicket just outside the leg stump, make it very difficult for someone to score, kid him a bit too. <laughs> and, you know, and, and get the... Uh, Ian Botham was not quite so good at that, but he was always wanting to get people out and would try anything to do so. He was a wonderful flair bowler. And he was, uh, uh, when I was lucky enough to captain him, it was the beginning of his career, he was at his best as a bowler. Yeah, swinging he got, And the quicker. He was, he was sharp. You know, he, I think he got less fit and back went and various other things happened. <laughs> anyway, I, I think he became slightly less good than he was at the beginning. It's interesting that both of them and Warren had other things happen to them. I mean, there's a determination. <laughs> there's a determination there to enjoy your life, isn't there? And that reflects in the way you express yourself on the field of play. Yeah, cricket to me was always fun. You know, I never saw cricket as a job. I, I, I always sort of thought I was lucky to actually play cricket, um, to have that opportunity. So I never really saw it as a job. Every time I went out in the field, I thought, how lucky am I to be doing this? So I always wanted to have fun. Um, sometimes that was after six o'clock as well, when the last ball was bowled. But, <laughs> but most of the time, it was all about fun. And um, I, I think if you look at all the players, they generally, that's their personality. They play like their personality. If you look at all the players, it might be the odd exception, but most of the time, you look at all the players that play. Just about their personality is how they play the game. And you can generally get a feel about what someone's like. But I was always up for fun. We could see your determination, your pride in Sri Lanka, your pride in your own performance. We saw you begin and you had a great talent. You kept wicked as well. Um, that talent began to morph into very substantial innings, particularly under pressure. Uh, your record abroad is as good as it is at home. And now you sit in the pantheon of the modern era along with... Uh, Tendulkar and Lara, Ponting, Callis and Sankakara, I'd say, the five truly great players of the modern age in batting. Um, was that a very conscious thing to get better all the time, or does time just adapt you and you adapt to it? I had no choice, Mark. If I didn't get better, I was not going to play for long in, in the Sri Lankan side. When I first started, I started as a one-day cricketer, replacing Ramesh Kalavitarna. Mm. And Ramesh had such a huge reputation. I remember when I got selected, there were protests in Ramesh's hometown saying, who is this? No, no, this is true. There were people on the streets carrying placards saying, who is this young upstart who's been selected ahead of our favorite, you know, the son of Sri Lanka, Ramesh Kalavitan. He's won a World Cup for us and all of this. That's the atmosphere I, I came into the team. And then I remember once I was in a little tuk-tuk going for training from, uh, from a hotel we were at. And, uh, and the, the tri-show driver asked me, oh, is it true that you and Ramesh Kalutan hate each other? And I said, yes, we, we don't even talk to each other. We just absolutely <laughs> hate each other. It's another little morsel for him to go and tell all his friends. But actually, Ramesh and I were very good friends and still are. Um, but I, my whole point was, 
I was willing to change. And that's how I played my entire career. And I remember Mahala Jawardhan and Tilan Samaravira were two of my very close friends at the side would laugh at me because I would change something, even from game to game or series to series. I would tap one day, not tap the other. I would move my bat a little bit more, bat a bit higher, change my grip, change my stance. Whatever allowed me to get through to score the runs that I needed to score. That's all I wanted to do, to be effective. I didn't care whether I looked good. I didn't care whether I took four hours to do it or two hours. Whatever the situation dictated, I changed to do. And I, 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 I still think that no player can go through an entire career without being open to change. And the more I got, it, got to terms with who I was, like Warney said, you, you can't hide sometimes. You play mm. as you are. And the more I got to terms with myself, my emotions, what worked, what didn't, what my weaknesses were, which is as important to know as your strengths, it allowed me to formulate better practice plans. But the one thing I'm really grateful for is the fact that I, I wasn't scared to change. And it was a risk at times. I had to invest some time and practice like mad, hit a, hit a lot of balls, so many that one of our batting coaches had to have a shoulder up after, <laughs> after six months. Um, but that was just the case. You get stale, you hit a wall, you can be the greatest player in the world. But if you don't have that ability to be realistic with yourself, honest with yourself, and know when to change and how to change, you get left behind because consistency is an upwardly mobile benchmark. You do the same thing over and over again, the rest leave you behind. And that was the way I approached my cricket. Do you like where Test cricket sits now? Do you like the standards? Do you like batsmen playing the shots they play and expressing themselves in the way they do? Do you think defensive technique has been compromised? Yes, I mean, but I do like it. Um, I think, I tell you where I think, um, I think that the uh, attacking um, mentality has got less and that could do with being more is in the field placings, especially to, to batsmen when they first come in and getting people out. The best way of stopping somebody scoring runs is to get him out. And I think that people are too quickly put people back on. I know the bats are better and people hit the ball harder and they play more shots and they're fitter and faster and everything. And, and perhaps the pitches have become a bit easier over the years. I'm not sure they are right now. But I, I think that people too quickly put deep cover point in, deep square leg in, deep long, long mm. on. You know, I think they're, they don't tease the batsman. They don't get the batsman to do something you know, like that he might not quite yeah. be sure about, but would go for. Well, no one. Well, you agree with that completely? Yeah, I, I think, I think the you've got to think of the attitude in the modern player that mostly that they, they know that the batsmen don't fear any fielders. If it's deep mid-on, they can just hit it straight over the head. What I, I, I believe, though, especially with spinners when they first come in, is make them earn the first one. Yeah. Just make them earn that first shot, mm -hmm. take it down the ground, because I still think you can, can hold out. You, you, and for a batsman, it, it, for the bowler, you've got to say... The batsman's worried about you, rather than you worry about the batsman. Yeah. Let, let the bowler stand at the top of the mark, dictate terms, set his field, take a bit of time, make the batsman think about you. Make a big thing of bringing the field up, mid-off, mid-on, that you can't just dong it down the ground for one. Don't let them get in. Um, so yeah, I, I like, I'd like to see, which I go back to before, what I said about captaincy. Those little things. Where in the first few overs, don't have all the fielders back on the ring. Cut off the single. In T20, you see it all the time. They're all on the circle just giving away a single. You can still get a catch through there or just stop a single. Two dot balls and suddenly the big shot's coming. You play... Go on. Sorry. When I used to play against Warnie, when I first started as a young kid and Warnie was already the, the I was legend. I nice to you though, wasn't I? <laughs> well, in, in a way, he would come up to me as soon as I came into bat and he'd discuss field placings with, <laughs> with punter. <laughs> So that I could hear, oh, no, no, leave mid wicket open. He's not going to get a shot through there. Yeah, yeah, put him up here because he, he can't hit me through here. And Mike was talking about ego. And the moment I hear this in my young mind, I'm arrogant. And I'm like, oh, no, that's exactly where I'm going to hit him. <laughs> and that's exactly what he wants me to do. So he constantly hears this chatter, exactly what he wants you to hear over and over and over again. And I, I saw you do it to Strauss as well through mid wicket. You left it, you left it open, and um, and again you fall into the trap of just going along with what he, what exactly he wants you to do. Did he go and stand next to you? Because Briers used to come and stand next to us when we were young, insecure fellows beginning. He'd come and stand, right as you were taking guard, and he'd stand right there and say, "I don't think we need anybody in the covers for this guy, do we?" <laughs> and I'd think, I think I've never met him. I've never seen him before. I've never, you know. What is this about? That's the psycho game, isn't it? That's, that's what's so fascinating about it. And that isn't sledging. There's nothing outside the spirit of cricket there. That's seeing if the guy's got anything between here to deal with it. 
Yeah, it's fun too. It's fun too. Yeah. 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 It's, it's fun. It's just fun. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, like, especially when you played against Nasser Hussein. No, yeah. The fun, the fun ones, the fun ones is when you like you do stand there. You, like uh, it, I remember Mark Taylor a lot. Tub was always at slip, so you I don't know just before the start of an over, you'd get Tub and say, "What do you reckon, Tub?" And you'd sort of both walk up to the crease, and the batter would be standing there marking centre. You sort of thought, hey, "Just what about point? Should you just move him a bit finer?" And the batsman, you just sort of see him go. Just have a little look, and then you'd move him about two metres finer, and they go, no, no, just a bit, just, and he'd be exactly the same spot. But you'd just move him. Like, he wouldn't actually do anything. He'd go backwards and forwards to exactly the same spot. And then you look at Tub, and you'd go back to your top of your mark, you know, look at Tub, and he'd be just like, just sitting down there laughing. But that's, that's, that's the fun stuff, yeah. It didn't always work, but when it did, it was fun. Yeah, we, tr- we tried to get Murali to copy Warney and, and, and actually do some of the psyching out of the bats, but he just couldn't stop smiling at the bats. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you doing? You're playing against them, and he's just be smiling. <laughs> I'm, I was very interested listening to Briers about the spirit of the game. Um, in Australia, the spirit of the game isn't a big conversation, is it? There's a perception. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'd like it placed on record. That's not exactly what I meant. <laughs> What I meant was Australians don't waste time talking about the spirit of the game. They set out to play in the spirit that they're brought up to play, which is to play hard and fair. And you were very clear after the sandpaper thing in Cape Town, you were very clear that, there are, that the Australian way is to play hard but fair. But sure, you played hard. Yeah, I, I think sport should be played hard and fair. Um, I was disappointed like everybody else uh, with the Aussies in South Africa. Um, I don't know how it actually got to the stage where you're sitting in your dressing room and say, hey, listen, put some sandpaper down your pants and walk out into the ground and then when the ball gets thrown to you, you know, just give it a bit of a... Uh, that was disappointing that it actually got to that stage. Um, but I think in all uh, the eras that I played in and, and the time I played in with all the opposition teams too, we had great rapport with the opposition. Um, you know, we were obviously a successful team at that time. Um, so everyone wanted to beat us, and I think occasionally we probably pushed the, the boundaries and we probably went a little bit too far, but I'd, I'd like to think that we played in the spirit of the game. We, we always played in the spirit. We were always first to shake hands. We, if someone made 100 or took five wickets, we'd go and say, well done. Um, but there was a time when one of your captains, Steve Waugh, coined the phrase mental disintegration. From Alan Border, actually. He got it from Alan Border, I believe. He said... I'll stand by Alan Border any day of the week. <laughs> so, so he didn't. Not say. Steve Waugh, but I'll stand by Alan Border. Okay. Well, whoever said. I, I, yeah. I, I, anyway. Um, yes. It, it, is, I think that, that was, is that a phrase that it was relevant in your. I think that was to sell a book for Steve Waugh, I think. I don't think I ever heard it before then. Yeah. Yeah. Out, of, out, of, out of my comfort zone, I think, was the title of Steve Yeah, I don't, I just, I mean, I don't know. You, it's a narrow line between mental disintegration or out of your comfort zone and, you know, short, fine, third man, two yards this way and two yards that way and standing by the back. Those are things, there's a grey area, isn't there? And I, I would say that most of that is fair dues, you know? I mean, it, it, something about it getting, the word boorish that Mike Atherton used quoting Martin Crow mm. seemed to me a, a good word to use. <laughs> the difference between something humorous with yeah. an element of playfulness, with an element of, of knowing that someone yeah. might be disturbed by it or might be une- or unsettled or yeah. might be made to get you know, too much ego. I think it, it, mm. it's, it's like that difference, yeah. isn't it? Well, I think one of the best series, I think back to the 2005 Ashes series. Um, it was a terrific series. England won and they were the better side. But every test match we had there, there was some sort of heroics from an England player or an Australian player. And I look back, to after the game, we both socialised all the time. And I think that series captured the public's imagination too because one of the talent and the and the skill that was on display, but two, the camaraderie between the two teams and three, the spirit in which it was played. I, I think that was a, a terrific series for, uh, for the game of cricket. I thought it um, really showcased everything to do with cricket and it was a fantastic series. The wrong result, but it was a fantastic series. <laughs> England deserved to win, but it was, um, it was a I great really, series. I really agree with and like Michael's um, idea that the spirit of the game is perfect as it is, written as a preamble, used as an idea, applied here and there as and when. I agree that the social mechanics of the way you're brought up will certainly influence your view of it, 
But, uh, but I've always liked it. I'm astonished when Athos wrote what he wrote, that it's so many people dismiss it out of hand rather than think it through and just apply it as and when, as we would to life. It's how you behave. It's what you respect and what you don't respect and what you want, as you said in that film. What you want from yourself and your opponent. And often what you show when, you, when you're just doing, going along th with things and something happens and you respond spontaneously or naturally, and sometimes you respond well and sometimes you don't. I mean, people, you, it does show you. It shows you up. Yeah. You reveal yourself in the game. Um, we've got five or six minutes. We're going to go super quick through a bunch of questions now. Do we like the 100? Yeah, up to now, yes. Uh, yes, yes, we do. Um, um, I, I, I think, you know, the, it's going down the Australian way of, 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 of describing things. Black snake, brown snake, and the 100. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a great concept, great points of difference. Thanks. I think the vindication of it will be the quality of the cricket that is played and, of course, the ability of the spectator, the young child, the family to be able to form a connection with it and understand it um, as it is played. You like the hunt? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think it's another form of the game. Um, there's a lot of different forms of the game, but I think it's, a good, it's worth a try. I think it could be good. Um, I like, anything new is always nice about the tactical side of things, you know, 10 ball overs and when do you bowl them and 100 balls. Is it, there'll be some sort of pattern and whoever works that out quicker will probably get ahead of the game. But um, I like it. I think it's worth a try and I'm behind it. No, I agree. I, I love the way you, you, you like anything new that can have a new idea on it. Yeah. Mm. I do too, actually. But it's really nice to hear. Mm. But uh, yes, I think we, we're, we're now embarked on it. Let's make it... Mm happen and work. Yeah, I, I like the fact, I mean, we all grew up playing in many different guises, formats, distances. Um, we played anywhere, on the beach, in the park, in the street, wherever we played, and we'd play for 10 minutes or for two hours if we could, and it didn't matter whether we played for 10 balls, 100 balls, or 400 balls. We were still playing with bat and ball, and that's the point of it. So I'm very in favour of giving it a go. Um, what do we think about the World Cup? Let's focus for a second. Do we, England are pretty hot favourites. Uh, we all know that you know, there's no, as the West Indies proved in 1983, having won the first two, there can be mighty shocks. What's your instinct for this World Cup? I don't, I don't see enough of it to know, really. I mean, I would support England, and, and obviously they're a good team. They must be one of the best teams in the, in the competition. Um, India, not a bad team. They're probably dodgy, not quite sure about their batting. Um, apart from Kohli, who I'd come back to as, as, as good as anyone in, the, in the, playing the game including the one-day game. Um, I don't know. I, I think these are the experts. Um, well, I, I think England come in as probably the hot favourites. I mean, they've played some wonderful cricket over the last few years. Um, I think they're well led by Owen Morgan. I think the one thing they'll probably, the first time they'll have to worry about these is expectations from within and also from the noise from outside. Because I think within their group, I think they think they're the best side and I think they think they should win it. Uh, the expectations for the country getting behind them, I think it's very important the start of the tournament, how they start. Um, but I think the expectations is something a lot of this England side might not have experienced for a while, about heading into a major World Cup. Um, but I think they've got the tools to do it. They've got some really good match winners. I think Archer's a, a very good addition. Um, a look at India, I think they've got some pretty good batting all around. Uh, they've got probably the best bowler in the world in Bumrah. So I think they'll do pretty well. The spinners um, will do well. But I'm not saying it just because I'm Australia, but um, I, I think Australia played pretty well in these big events. I think they've played in five of the last six finals of the World Cup. Reigning champs, won it last time here in England. Um, and I think they've got a, a lot to prove to the world of cricket, the public um, themselves, to gain a bit of respect back. And when anyone's got a lot to prove, like a David Warner and Steve Smith, they're dangerous. So I, I just think Australia's bowling's very good and they've got a few match winners in the, with the bat too. So, and, I th and you can make an argument for the West Indies. You make an argument for New Zealand always perform well in this tournament. Um, I think Afghanistan will put up a few upsets here and there too. Uh, if they can make some sort of score, there's spinners and that could go to work. Uh, South Africa will play well. It, it really is going to be a terrific World yeah, Cup. Very open, yeah. I, would, I you, think... would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I agree with Warney on a lot of things. Also about the, 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 the tactical ability of the teams, the matchups in terms of selection when they go into play a side like England or Australia or South Africa, whoever it may be, to get 
those little competitions, those matches within a match right, you know, how do you, how do you break an opening partnership, how do you deal with a Joss Butler, uh, reading the game, understanding and trying to keep a step ahead of what they will try to do, those things will count a lot and the ability to compete and compete and compete until it comes to a, a choice where you try and put so much pressure on a side that they make the wrong choice and that's what the playoffs and the mm. finals are all about. You can be down and out, but if you take the game deep enough and actually keep asking the right questions from the opposition at a certain point, the wrong answer can, can right. make yeah. you win. The other thing about a World Cup is that everyone talks about a team effort. That. A World Cup, yeah, you need to do that, but your big players win you the World Cup. The big players in every time, if they stand up, you'll win. Mm. Yeah, they'll have to, a few special performances, yep. your batsman yeah. once win. in a while. Win you a couple of games yourself in big yeah. moments. I remember asking Andy Flower what he thought the most important thing a coach could do for his team was. And he said, get them to a mental position where they can make the right choice under pressure. And that sums up what you were just saying. Let's turn to the ashes then, because this is, you know, the drama of this summer will continue. Um, and, and the fact that the competition we so love, and you might give us a different perspective on it altogether, but, I mean, the ashes is back. The two teams look very evenly matched to me. Well, yeah, I think, again, we'd be favourites at the moment slightly, wouldn't we? I would think so. Um, weather, pitches, everything also revolves around the pitch, doesn't it? You said earlier. Uh, mm. if, the, if the pitch does a bit, if it swings a bit, we'd probably be, probably be better, slightly better than Australia. If they uh, can, can man manufacture a little extra green grass. Yeah. Well, I, th I think... They to do sometimes. Yeah. Slower, slower, greener pitches will favour England. Yeah. Harder, straighter, yeah. more bouncier yeah. ones exactly. will favour us. August, September, late start, tired pitches. Spin might play a yes. part in the yes. Ashes too. Net so. and line. So I, I think England have to go favourites. Australia haven't won in England since 2001. 18 years, haven't won here in Ashes series. So England going as hot favourites to that too. I think they look at Australia's bowling though. I think Australia's bowling is very, very good. I think both sides are very similar. Got good bowling, good middle order batters. At the top of the order, both the question marks of both teams. So, whoever's top order probably performs the best. The top three or four will probably win. Can I leave you as a mean question to hit you with out of the blue? I did this a couple of years ago and got various answers. Um, what's the most special thing about cricket to you? Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, um, the most special thing. I suppose it is. I'm, I, well, I think it is. I was going to say team, the team and the dressing room and all, and getting a team, uh, being in a team that plays together. Uh, but also, of course, it is the, the fantastic thing about cricket is individual contests within a team context. And there aren't many games like that. Mm. Baseball a bit, but it doesn't go on for five days, mm. a match. And, and to have those individual, you know, so every individual ha is, is tested, especially in test cricket, but so is the team as a whole. And what, you know, so I, I would say that combination is mm. Mm. special. Uh, yeah. Ooh, um, I think when you retire from the game, the biggest thing you miss is your friends in the dressing room. So I think it's not so much the playing, I think it's the people you miss and the people you meet along the journey. So for me, the greatest thing about cricket is the opportunity to meet a wide, a wide range of people, from you know, whether it be Elton John to Ed Sheeran to... The guy on the street who all loves cricket, the opportunity to meet all those people and the opportunity to meet people that you play with and against. I mean, it's just, it's, it's great. Mm. President Desi, over to you. It's, it, it's a tough one. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the time I played. I absolutely loved everything, even the times we lost World Cup finals. Um, for me, I think personally, I've retired now and to be able to be detached enough to really look at my career with almost a, a rosy perspective and, and really remember only the good things and not be bitter and be able to still have the players I played with sit around a dinner table with me and, and have a meal and chat. Those are the things I, I, I really remember and, and, and enjoy. Yes, the runs and the victory, all of that, but there are certain things that are a little bit more important when you look back. And Warnie will say the dressing room, the friends, <coughs> uh, the, the chats in the dressing room. It's the same thing for me, really. I don't miss the playing. Um, at all, um, but, but I, 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 I do feel that I'm a, I'm a little bit more liberated now that I've retired and, and I can put it yes, into that, perspective. That yeah. sort of reflective glory. I'll leave you with the very last word. You must be looking forward to the next year and a half of your life. 
Yes, <laughs> yes, uh, very much so. Uh, not, not just in terms of, of, of the MCZ position, position and, and, and being president after Anthony, but also just life in general. Um, and I think I've been very lucky to be able to, like I said, to move on and, and, and do new and interesting things and still be tied to the cricket uh, and tied to the game in, in many ways, in peripheral ways. Um, so, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it very much. Yes. Right. Well, we, I, I'm sure you would all agree. We've had three of cricket's most special people ever in, in the you know, 150 years that it's been at the, the top of the, of the tree, really, 1877, the first... <laughs> Test match, and, and three of the really special people are sitting on this stage tonight. So to Kumar, to Shane, and perhaps most particularly on this occasion, to Mike, thank you. Right. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to be cheating on that. I'm writing it all up. I don't know. Absolutely. All right.